Good morning. My name is Melissa Daniels, and I'm filling in for Pastor Bill this week. Uh, before I start, I just want to let you know, if you hear any snoring in the background, it is not me. Uh, there's my daughter's cat behind me, and uh, I'm going to just quickly show you here who is responsible for the snoring. Um, this is my daughter's dog, Zoe, who is laying in my daughter's doll carrier and uh, is my faithful guardian and companion now that Ava is no longer here. So full disclosure, I apologize for any background snores. Hopefully they're not coming from YouTube. Anyways, um, as I mentioned before, my name is Melissa Daniels and I am filling in for Pastor Bill this week. Um, before I begin, let's just start quickly in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this new day and for this opportunity to share a message of hope. Lord, we pray for everyone tuning in. May the Holy Spirit open their hearts and minds so that they might receive your truths and just be encouraged. Lord, we lift up Pastor Bill as well as he's recovering. We pray, God, that you would just continue to restore him fully so that he can once again lead us. And Lord, to you I surrender. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would guide my steps and my words for the next few minutes. May my mouth and my story that you have written be honoring to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, as I mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned before, um, this morning I want to share with you a message of hope. It's a journey of faith that I've walked. It's one that I understand. Um, and it's one that God has graciously uh, brought me and my family through. For those of you who aren't familiar uh, with my family or my story, I am a wife and a mother. I have three children, Nathan, who's 26, Riley, who's 21, and Ava Sophia, who will forever be 12 and a half. Now, my daughter uh, was diagnosed at two years old, just right after her second birthday with leukemia. And I have to tell you, her cancer was a storm that I never saw coming. And I think that in life, most of those storms that can change um, our landscape and our very lives, we don't see looming on the horizon. And they sweep in and basically wipe our footing out from underneath of us. That cancer storm was also a journey that was so much longer than I ever expected. At diagnosis, Ava's oncologist told us ten and a, or two and a half years, excuse me, two and a half years of treatment, not ten and a half. Um, but the message I want to share today is one of hope. And I know some of you may be thinking, how can it be about hope when your only daughter is dead? But I assure you, it is. And I am not the author of this story. And my hope is that by the end of this message, you'll know who is writing each and every page. Now, over the 10 and a half years Ava fought leukemia, she relapsed over and over. And though a small piece of my heart broke each time she relapsed, God was faithful. And we saw his mighty hand move with more miracles over that 10 and a half year period than I've ever witnessed before in my lifetime. Looking back, I have to think that because God knew how difficult the last portion of Ava's journey would be, he made sure in those previous years that we really saw him, that we really knew him, because we were going to need him to get through those tough middle places before Ava reached her finish line and heard the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to start this morning from a verse uh, in found in Micah, and that's 7-7. But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I will wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. This one single verse holds several key truths, especially when we look at it from the perspective of being stuck in the middle. First, the writer is watching in hope for the Lord. He's expectant. He is just watching. Then he waits for his God, who he knows is his Savior, and finally, he trusts that God is listening to him. These are key because in those hard middle places is where it becomes very easy to lose hope and faith. It's hard to wait because our timing is never God's timing. And sometimes as we wait, it can feel as if we've been abandoned by God and he's no longer listening to our cries for help. 
At least that's how I felt those last six months of Ava's life, which is why I've titled today's message. Um, and again, bear with me. Stuck in the middle. When the waiting is hard and you wonder where God is. Now, being stuck in the middle of anything is usually never a fun place to be. And my story is going to begin today with Ava and I, her last six months of her life as she was inpatient at Johns Hopkins receiving her second transplant. Going into that transplant, I was full of hopeful expectation. Ava had suffered a fifth relapse and miraculously achieved a sixth remission, which we knew would be short-lived. And so I moved forward with this transplant, fully believing that God was going to show up and show off in a very big way. I was certain my daughter would not only walk in those hospital doors, but that she would also walk out and be a living and breathing testament of God's healing hand. Only this time, it wasn't the case. As I mentioned earlier, my entire family had seen God move in Ava's life over and over. We witnessed firsthand his healing power as he miraculously extended Ava's time with us, much longer than her oncologist ever expected or anticipated. And so we were fully expecting him to move again, and he did. It's just that sometimes when you're stuck in those tough middle places, it's hard to see what's right around you or right in front of you. The last six months of Ava's life were soul crushing and heartbreaking. And it was there inside Ava's hospital room where I began to grow weary and lose my lose hope, heart, and faith as my hope began to die alongside of my daughter's body. There was one day in particular, and it had been another rough day. And I'm going to tell you, in the hospital, I don't know that we actually had one full good day together. Um, but this day, this day in particular, was extremely hard. Ava was very uncomfortable, and so she continuously asked me to pray over her, which I did. To the point that I was out of prayers and just repeating the same words over and over. Finally, my daughter looked up at me, and with defeat in her voice, she just said, Mom, please call Clayton. You know, Clayton is our family friend. Um, but Ava went on to say, you know, please call Clayton, because God isn't listening to us anymore. I'm disappointed in God. I know he can heal me. He's done it before, but he won't do it now. What do you do with that? What do you say? Ava was starting to wonder if God was still faithful and if he cared, if he was listening. I had a split second to decide how to respond, and I, I think I failed here as a mother because in that split second, I chose to be honest with my daughter. As I told Ava, I was disappointed in God too. I didn't understand why God was allowing to suffer Ava to suffer when I knew he could fix her. I knew he didn't even need to touch her or speak a word, but in one single breath, he could heal her and make her whole again. As soon as those words left my mouth, I regretted them, but it was too late. They had already been spoken. And honestly, I figured God already knew my heart. And at that point, I just needed to be honest with my daughter. Because the truth is, we were both disappointed. We were both struggling. We were stuck in the confines of the hospital with dreams of getting home and yet no way to get there because one problem after another, after another plagued my daughter. And this brings me to my first point this morning and it's this, God understands when you begin to lose heart and faith as the middle place becomes a seemingly endless prison. It's okay to question him. It's okay to get angry. When you are faithless, he remains faithful. Look at the story in the book of Mark, chapter 9, as we read of a demon-possessed boy who the disciples were unable to heal and make clean. After a group had gathered, Jesus came upon them, and he said to the Father in chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Not some things, all things. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, 
I believe. Help my unbelief. That passage is so important because it lets us know that in this life, we will struggle to walk by faith. And it's okay. It's okay to admit it. Jesus not only loves us anyway, he continues to remain by our side, even when our faith wavers. And trust me, in this journey with Ava, my faith wavered. There were many times that I was told, you know, if my faith wavered, the Lord wasn't going to heal my daughter, that her healing was going to pass and then she would die. But I want you to hear the end of this passage where Jesus went on to heal the boy, even though the boy's father was struggling to believe. Jesus didn't shame the father. He didn't ask the father, don't you know who I am? Instead, he healed the boy. That scene right there in the Bible gives us hope because there will be a time in each of our lives where we'll be faced with a similar situation. And people may tell us, we're gonna miss the miracle if our faith falters even the slightest. But this story lets us know Jesus understands. And not only that, he still loves us and he healed the boy. That healing, that miracle is not solely dependent on us, on our great faith, dependent on Jesus. My second point this morning is a promise found repeatedly in God's word, and it's this. God promises never to leave or forsake his children. Deuteronomy 31.8 tells us, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Let me tell you, I was afraid. I was discouraged. My whole family was discouraged. We were all discouraged. My family and I were praying over Ava night and day. We were obedient and anointed her with oil and laid hands on her as we prayed. And yet some of the very things that we prayed against came to be. And sometimes within hours of our spoken prayers. Do you know how disheartening it is to pray that the Lord would heal and protect your daughter's kidneys only to be walking back into surgery with her so that she can receive a PD catheter in her belly and start receiving dialysis because those kidneys that you prayed for, they failed? It got to the point in the journey where I began to wonder if God had allowed Satan to sift my family as wheat. In Luke 22 verse 31, we see Jesus speaking to Peter and saying, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Now we'll come back to the rest of that passage in a few minutes, but that's exactly how I felt. I felt as if God had allowed Satan to basically have at our family, and I felt abandoned. For the first time in years, I could not sense or feel God's presence, not in my prayers, not when I read his word, I couldn't feel him the way I normally did. But deep down, and I mean deep, deep down, I knew not to go on feelings because feelings are just that. They're feelings. They're not truth. I knew that even though I couldn't see him or feel him, God was still with us because I knew God. I had seen him move. I had seen his miracles before. And so I knew and trusted him and his word. And I continued to trust his son and just lean into them. And during those months, not only did I hold close to God's word, but I also embraced Hillsong's Who You Say I Am. Because in that song, the words, I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Those words were like a soothing balm to my hurting heart, and they became my anthem. And every time I would hear Satan shout in my mind that I was forsaken, that God had left me, I would counter and remind myself, no, I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who God says I am. The last week of Ava's life were my darkest moments. And it was probably, no, 
It was, it was the worst week of my life. I have never cried so much and I have never begged and pleaded with God so much. All along now for months, the Lord had been reaching out to my daughter and revealing his next steps to her so she would have no fear of what was to come. But yet I had no idea of the ways he had been working. Early on in transplant, Ava had told me she had a dream and in it, God told her he would be taking her home. Only Ava told God she wasn't ready just yet. Now, I'm not sure why Ava told God she wasn't ready, but honestly, I'm going to think it's my fault because I was the one who kept telling Ava we had so many adventures and things to do after she got out of the hospital. Ava's dream, those words she spoke, they were nothing I wanted to hear but they weren't the only time that I was gonna hear her say those words. A few months down the road, Ava again blurted out that she would be leaving us soon. Her brother Riley, his girlfriend Abby and I had all been sitting on her bed, talking and laughing. When Ava spoke those words out of the clear blue and stopped our conversation dead in its tracks. You know how it feels when something scares you and you literally jump inside and you feel like your heart stops for a second? That's how I felt. I was startled. I was afraid, but I didn't want Ava to see it. So I jokingly said to her, oh, really? You know, where are you going? Ava answered, home to heaven, where Jesus is going to heal me like he did with Malki. Now, Malki also battled leukemia, was probably the closest little friend Ava had during her cancer journey. And those two little girls bravely fought their diseases together. Malki had died a year or two before Ava. And just before she passed, a few days before, we were at the hospital and Malki knew we were there. So she requested to see her friend one last time. So when I heard Ava's response to my question, there was no stopping the tears. And I tried my hardest never to cry in front of Ava, never to let her see that I was scared. But this time I couldn't stop them. I tried to tell Ava that all of us will eventually die, but that her time had not yet come. Because you see, I wasn't ready to let my baby girl go. I wanted more time with her. So I wouldn't listen to her truths. And looking back, I'm sorry I didn't. I'm sorry I didn't ask her to tell me more about what God was revealing because I can only imagine just how beautiful it was as he was reaching out to her and showing her these things. Here I was discouraged. I thought God had turned his back on us and left Ava and I to fight these battles alone in the hospital. And I was wrong. He was with my daughter the entire time working in her life. I just couldn't see it because I was stuck in the middle of it. Which brings me to my third point this morning, and it's this, God is always at work in our lives, even when we cannot see him or feel him. Psalm 139.5 tells us, you have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Although I couldn't physically see or sense God, he was gently holding my daughter close in times where I was unable to. He was showing her things which weren't for me to see as he was preparing her to go home to heaven. And here's an incredible thought. Ava knew exactly who was talking to her, God and Jesus. She knew where her new home would be, heaven. And she knew in that instant her legs, which were too weak to hold her upright any longer, would be strengthened and made whole, and she would be able to run and dance without ever growing tired again. Healed. Ava knew God and Jesus, and God and Jesus knew my Ava. You see, God loved my daughter so much. He began reaching out to her in her waking hours and in her sleep. Can you imagine what kind of a God would do that for one of his children? That, my friends, is a merciful and loving God. And he didn't do that just for Ava because she was special. 
He did it because he loves her. And he loves us. And so when we are in our pain and struggled moments, the Lord is also calling out to us. The only request he says or he asks is that we would surrender our lives to him and invite him to come in. Do you remember how I said when Ava told me about her first dream where God said he was taking her home and she told him she wasn't ready? Well, a few days before Ava died, she began to basically sing out the words, I'm ready, I'm ready. My mom and I were there. So we asked her, Ava, you know, what are you ready for? She never looked at us. She just looked right past us. She continued to sing out, I'm ready, I'm ready. And that's when my mom and I knew Ava wasn't talking to us. She was talking to God. She was telling the same God she had told months before that she wasn't ready, that she now was. I cannot tell you how I felt in that moment. Shattered? Absolutely. Devastated? Definitely. Peace? Baby. I knew my daughter was more than ready, but I still wasn't. The last weekend of Ava's life, she was surrounded by family as we loved on her and massaged her aching legs, put lotion on her dry, cracked feet. At this point, Ava was wearing an oxygen mask to help her breathe, and she began motioning us to us that she wanted to take the mask off. Uh, her dad and I were concerned because the mask helped her breathe and we didn't know if that would cause her lungs any distress, but Ava was determined to talk and so we took the mask off. Ava spoke a few words here and there, um, but really her final words to us towards the end of the evening, she began to motion to me that she couldn't breathe and so I sent the nurse to go find the respiratory therapist. As I explained to Ava that once we put the mask back on, she wouldn't be able to speak. She nodded that she understood. But before that mask went on, she looked at me and she said, I love you. Set me free. Please set me free. A few days later, Jesus finally set my baby girl free from the hospital bed, which had become her prison. And although she was finally free, I was broken. The morning Ava died, I packed my bags to return home, to a home and a bed I hadn't slept in for months. I felt like a foreigner in a strange land. Originally, we had packed our bags in the cold of winter, and now I was returning home to a lush green landscape. But I walked into that home and it didn't feel like home and it didn't smell like home and it didn't sound like home because the quiet was deafening. I remember walking upstairs to my office and as I looked at pictures behind my desk on the wall, the Lord caught my attention. And there in the middle of the pictures was a four by six card I had taken home from a Dare to Be event back in 2016. I'm gonna try and get this picture up for you so you can see this. Again, bear with me for just a moment. Um, and those are the pictures behind my desk. You can see all my children, Ava, Nathan, Riley, my nephew. Um, but there towards the center in the, on the right is the card. And there's the Dare to Be card. And the one word that I wrote was free. Free. I was in awe. God was showing me how He had been working and weaving beauty in the midst of our tragedy, in the midst of our tragedy, years in advance. Free. The same word Ava had said when she made her request known. And please hear me when I say this. It would have been normal for a child in Ava's condition to say, "Please." Please let me go. 
But Ava said, free. Please set me free. My daughter was free, free from the constant pokes and prods, checking her blood sugars and administering insulin, free from having her belly drained of fluid every day, free from any other pain or suffering, free from the confines of her hospital bed, free in and because of Jesus Christ. That is God. But he didn't stop there. A few days later, as I was driving to the beach with my parents, Hillsong's Who You Say I Am came on the radio. And for the very first time, I heard what had to be Ava's anthem. You see, all those months in the hospital, I had been focused on my anthem. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. But I had missed Ava's anthem. It was the best part. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Again, I was awestruck because God is so good. He had been work at, at work all this time. I just couldn't see it when I was stuck in the middle. I wasn't able, it wasn't until I was able to look back that I could see some of those pieces, like those of a puzzle, come together. Now, there is a lot more of this story that I could tell you. We just don't have the time because, honestly, if I tried to share it, you'd be here for days. Seriously. Um, but I want to leave you with this one final point, and it's this. When you are stuck in the middle, Press in and press on. The first three points talked about God, how he understands when we have shaky faith, that despite our wavering faith, he promises never to leave or forsake us. And three, that he's always working in ways that we cannot always see. But the fourth point this morning, the fourth point is our call to action. Press in and press on. Get up, show up, and give your best every day despite the circumstances going on around you. Don't stop living and don't stop clinging to the one who saves. Don't stop praying. The battles which were won in the Bible happened because men and women who trusted God weren't afraid to hit their knees in prayer. Even Jesus showed us by example is he often left the crowds to go spend time with his father. In Luke 5, verse 16, we read, Jesus often withdrew into the wilderness for prayer. Folks, the middle ground can be a tough place to be. But Romans 12, 12 tells us, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Let me read that again. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. That can be hard to do, especially when life is crushing. You may find that there's times where in your own life, the very act of breathing is all you can do. In those moments, God hears even the quietest whispers of a broken prayer. When you have no words or prayers left, God hears the cries of your heart. As I mentioned before, there were many times during those hard months with Ava where I had lost my words to pray. And I just started to wonder where God was in this mess because it was a mess. And then God showed up one morning in the form of a man who came to change the clock because we needed to spring forward an hour. And as the man adjusted, the hands on the clock, I stood watch over Ava at the foot of her bed. Once he finished, he came and stood beside me and looked down at her with sorrow. Little boy, he asked. Little girl, I said, because Ava was bald, so he assumed she was a boy. We stood there in silence, and I can't even tell you for how long, 
but I wasn't afraid. And I wasn't uncomfortable. I had peace standing beside this stranger. Finally, the man turned to leave. And as he did, he looked at me and said, don't stop praying, mom. Don't stop praying. As he shut the door, I whispered, I won't. A few hours later, a maintenance man came and showed up at our door wearing his Hopkins uniform, a name badge, and carrying his own bucket of tools. He quickly announced he was there to change the clock and I told him somebody had been there hours before. He didn't believe me, so I allowed him to take, in, take a step in and, and look at the clock. And as he did, he began to chuckle and mutter, I don't know who, and then he left. To this day, I have no idea who it was that came in to change that clock. I don't know if it was an angel or just a man that God used to be his hands and feet. But I do know this, God sent that man to encourage me to keep praying, not to give up, because God knew that my heart was breaking and I needed a word of encouragement in that moment. Before we end today, I wanna to circle back to the last part of the verse in Luke where Jesus is talking to Simon Peter. And again, it's found in Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. And Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith not, may not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Listen to the last part of that verse again. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. That's Jesus speaking. And if Jesus would pray for Peter, fully knowing that Peter's faith would fail him, and Peter would deny Jesus three times before the rooster crowed the next morning, then I was trusting and believing that Jesus would pray for me too. And so in the hospital, I asked Jesus to pray for me. When I had no words, when I had nothing left, I asked Jesus to pray for me. And a beautiful truth is, if you ask him, he'll pray for you too. Can you imagine the savior of the world beseeching his father on your behalf? He'll do it if you ask him. Don't be too proud to admit that you can't manage on your own because the truth is, we can't. We can try. And on our own strength, we will always fail. When you're hurting, your prayers don't have to be pretty. They just have to be real. Because the truth is, God already knows. He already sees everything, and he's just waiting for you to come to him. In your darkest hours, Jesus is there, waiting with open arms to rescue you and give you peace. His peace, which surpasses all understanding. I want you to know my family and I never stopped praying for a miracle, even after Ava died. I asked the nurses if I could accompany them to the morgue because I knew the same God who raised Lazarus and Jairus' daughter from the dead could still raise my Ava. And I wanted to be there if she sat back up. Only I wasn't allowed to take that final walk and Ava never sat back up, not here anyway. But I want you to hear me when I say this. God answered our prayers and he healed my daughter once and for all. It may not have been as I asked or as I had wanted, but he was faithful. Because as Ava took her last breaths, cradled in my arms, in a blink, she was made whole and went running, and I mean running, into the arms of Jesus. When you're struggling and stuck in the middle, don't give up. Press in to the one who saw all your days before you were even born. Psalm 139 verse 16 tells us, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. God sees you. He hears you and he knows. Even when you feel alone, he is with you. So press into him and his word and press on.
when the storms in life come, and trust me, if you're not in a storm right now, there will come a day where one will be on your horizon. And when that storm comes, Jesus Christ is the only anchor who holds steady. I want to close us in prayer right now, but before I do, maybe in your own life, you feel stuck. Maybe you get up every morning and head off to a job that you hate, but you have bills to pay and little mouths to feed, and so you stay. Or maybe right now you're in the middle of a complicated divorce, and you and your children are hurting and asking why. Maybe depression and anxiety have a firm grip on your life and have, have immobilized you from living a life of joy and purpose. Or maybe your life is disappointing and it looks unlike anything you ever imagined because you've allowed people and things into it which God never intended for you. And now you've found that you're stuck in a pit of regret and shame. Can I ask you this morning as I pray to get real with God and surrender whatever it might be at his feet? And maybe you don't know this God I'm talking about, but you want to. You want to be able to hear his voice as Ava did and know in your heart who is speaking to you. You want to be able to say, I'm ready. I'm ready. You want to know that there is something so much better for you, waiting for you after this life, that in your father's house, he's prepared a place for you. Then I'm going to invite you to surrender and humbly admit that you're a sinner in need of a savior today. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't try to clean yourself up before you come to God because God specializes in washing away our sins and restoring us. Don't wait for perfect before you come to Jesus because Jesus didn't come for perfect people. He came to save, to seek and save the lost. The truth is he came for me, he came for you. Let's pray. Heavenly the Father, thank you for each and every person watching today. We thank you, Lord, that even when our faith fails, you remain faithful. Thank you for being a good and gracious father who promises never to leave or forsake his children. Thank you for working in our lives in ways we cannot see or begin to understand. Holy Spirit, I ask now you break down walls or barriers which are keeping us from you. Help us to humbly admit we are all sinners in need of a savior. Thank you for sending your son to die for our sins and thank you for loving us in spite of the ugly parts. We surrender to you this morning and give you all we have, the broken pieces, the painful memories, the sin. Trusting and knowing that with you, the impossible becomes possible as you create magnificent beauty from the wreckage in our lives. Help us, Lord, to find purpose in our pain. Help us to understand that because of the sacrifice of your son, we can all be free. Please watch over and protect every person watching. May your Holy Spirit be evident as you work in their lives. We praise your holy name and give you thanks this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The journeys we will take in this life may not be easy. And the middle ground can at times be a place of hardship. But when you trust in the Lord, remember, you do not walk alone. Much love. God bless.